Ah. Right. Okay. So, so we left off yesterday. So I, what I've been trying to explain is, um, you know, the main use for the for the coalescent has been as a basically a neutral null model for everything, right? Um, and uh, uh, you know, an extremely efficient. Well, when it was first invented, I mean, for, for simple cases, you can derive lots of analytical results using this model. But it's also an extraordinarily efficient simulation tool, and it's probably much more uh, important that way, right? And the point here is, you know, even if, as Kavita pointed out yesterday, that even if you can't really do this with selection, and I'll talk a bit about what happens with selection anyway, uh, you, you people typically use it to simulate sort of the, the simplest possible expectation and then look for deviations for this, right? And the reason you need to do this is that the expectation isn't actually very simple, right? Even uh, just simulate and simple neutrality is complicated because of this, um, because of this fact that you have a tree-like structure that is random and then random mutations imposed on that. We're going to talk about recombination and population structure and stuff like that today. But here's just a simple example of... Um, um, uh, the, the variability of this process, right? I remember I told you about how tree heights uh, differ a lot. Um, if you take, and I showed plots of uh, how variability changed along the genome, right? Okay, so like when for people first started an analyzing sequence polymorphism data, uh, you know, they really didn't know what to do with it. And uh, a lot of people, like, you know, I'm slightly too old, but to be slightly mean-spirited, and uh, this is actually anyone who was trained in theoretical population genetics in the sort of 10 years after I got a PhD pretty much couldn't fail to get a job because uh, suddenly there was all this data from human genetics and there was so much money and all these people who had absolutely no idea what to do with the data. So anyone who actually understood what linkage equilibrium was, which pretty much guaranteed a faculty position somewhere. Uh, and, uh, you know, this kind of illustrates one of the very simplest things. So if you just take, say that you sequence a bunch of, um, uh, what is this? This is an, you sim say that you simulate sequence, you have the sequence data, uh, 10KB windows, uh, some kind of mutation rate on top of that. Uh, you do that a thousand times, as if you have a thousand loci, and you look at the distribution of polymorphism. What would you expect to see? Well, you know, naively, people would grab for, like, if you look at sequence, from phylogenetic models, and I'm talking about that a bit longer uh, later, right? If you have two sequences that have diverged a certain amount of time, uh, the amount of um, polymorphism you would see is Poisson distributed, right? If you have two sequences, it's just how many hits happen along these branches. Yes? Everyone with me on this? And, uh, uh, but, uh, and if you were to simulate something like that, you would get uh, a, a distribution like this in red here. If you simulate under the coalescent, you get a much, much broader spread, right? And that bigger spread, of course, comes from the fact that the sequence polymorphism, even under the simplest model that you can imagine, is this compound of Poisson process where you have random, random mutational process operating on a random gene genealogy, right? Somebody asked me yesterday about phylogenetic trees. I will talk about that in a bit later. So phylogenetic trees, the way they were originally envisioned, are trees for, for species, right? Like if you, if you align sequences from, you know, a zebrafish, a rat, and a human, you know, you're going to get a, set, a certain relationship, which also corresponds to the relationship between these species in, in some kind of very zoomed out way. Uh, and basically any gene you do will sort of show the same relationships. But if you, if you, take, uh, uh, if you take all the... So you say that you do that for some histone or whatever, right? Now take the same histone for us in this room. You know, there obviously isn't a phylogenetic tree there, right? It's a tree. It reflects our, you know, shared ancestry. It will tell us a little bit, and I'll get into that about population structure, as I mentioned yesterday. It's probably more likely that my two copies uh, you know, have a common ancestor that went, you know, one of you guys, but it's by no means certain uh, because most polymorphism in humans uh, go back, you know, the average coalescence times go back millions of years, right? So my, you know, the, my copy of, say, beta globin that I inherited from mom may be more closely related to, to one of your copies than it is to my dad's copy, right? Because uh, gene genealogy is 
uh, tend to spread out uh, like this very easily, right? There's not the division between sort of various ethnic groups and so on is not uh, very, very strong at all. Whereas if you did the same thing with a chimp, you can be sure that my two copies are more closely related. Uh, I'll talk a bit later what happens if you take a human, chimp, and gorilla, because then it's not actually so obvious what, what you see in this tree. Anyway, okay. Right, okay, so I don't need to say this again. Blah, blah, blah. Yes, okay, so, but what, what I'm trying to do here, and, and I, so bear with me a little bit, so it's fine to interrupt, you know, I would try to connect it to what people do with it all the time, but I'm just, what I'm trying to convey to you is this, this basic null model and why you might actually uh, you want to use it, right? And, and uh, I'll try to jump to like examples and then back to the theory again, right? Uh, but, but somehow it's important to go through, go through all the theory as well so people understand how, how this model actually works. So one of the reasons it is, it's a very good model is that in some sense, it's, in some, and, and it's very, very important, I think, well, this goes with all modeling, right? You know, all models are cartoons of reality. So modeling always takes a bit of good taste because you have to like figure out what assumptions can you make that don't, you know, don't matter. Or if, if you introduce ridiculous assumptions, uh, then you have a problem, right? And you, I, would, I would try to... There are many textbook results in population genetics that I think are ludicrous because they include assumptions that are patently false and absurd and never hold. But then there are some other things that, things that get glossed over that actually don't matter at all because the models are totally robust to that. And you can actually gain insight to, the, to that from, from the coalescent. So, for instance, so I introduced the coalescent here using a haploid right Fisher model. But it turns out, and just like the diffusion approximation, that uh, once you go to the scaling, uh, scaling approximation, a whole bunch of different models, like you can, you can derive the same coalescent using the Moran model, for instance, for, uh, for um, you know, population for, for random genetic drift. Doesn't matter, as we shall see, whether you have, doesn't matter whether you're haploid or diploid. Uh, you don't actually need the right fish or reproduction. All those things kind of all, that, that all comes out in the wash, as long as you know what you're doing. Uh, yeah. So yeah, so here's an example, for example, in the right Fisher model, uh, the variance of the number of offspring produced by an individual is, is that, which, you know, goes to one as the, as the population size is large, yes. So this is just, a you know, it's a binomial sampling, like every, everyone is equally likely to reproduce, and you just do sampling with replacement from the previous generation to make the next generation. Okay. Uh, but, you know, of course, in reality, it doesn't have to be like that, right? In, in fact, most available data, uh, like if you actually go out and look at uh, offspring number, uh, um, it usually has a bigger variance like that. You know, take some plant species out there. You, you have some array of plants, but, you know, maybe 90% of them get eaten by goats before they ever have a chance to reproduce, right? And then the other ones make up the rest of the population. Then, of course, the variance is much, much higher. Uh, Ophelia has, uh, isn't here yet, but you, if you think about, uh, you know, the environment is often heterogeneous, right? So some individuals produce a heck of a lot more offspring than the other ones, and, and, and so on and so forth. Okay, so you can easily generate this and say that the variance is this, right? But as long as this variance is bounded, uh, you can show that this, coalesce, this uh, such a model converges co to the coalescent, provided that you scale times appropriately, right, to take into account uh, the increased variance, right? So the bigger the variance, the faster genetic drift, right? And, the, you know, the faster the coalescent time scale operates. This makes sense, right? If you think about my analogy of beetles running around in, in a box, right? If there's a lot of, you know, the faster the beetles run, right, the more they're likely to run into each other. This is sort of a, uh, this, the, speed of, the speed of genetic drift. Somebody asked me yesterday about uh, multiple, uh, multiple coalescences, right? Um, uh, this, like John Wakeley has worked on this a lot recently, right? So in some species, now, it has to be bounded like this, right? I mean, you, there are, it has been suggested, and it's probably true that in some species of fish in particular, like spawning salmon or cod or something like that, right? You can have, you know, there's incredible mortality among the adults, right? You know, of the ones that go back. But then you have these gigantic fish, like, you know, the females can lay tens of thousands of eggs, right? So you can have a situation where, like, you know, a very small number of individuals end up producing, you know, the whole population, right? And then, of course, you know, things break down slightly. I think it's a pretty trivial modification, but then, you know, the, it's not quite accurate to assume that in any slice of time there's only one coalescent event. 
because there's just kind of this explosive uh, growth, right? But most of the time, this works perfectly fine. Yes. Right, okay. So, so this is both good news and bad news, uh, because, so for example, in humans, theta is about 10 to the minus 3, right? Uh, which means, so theta is also, you know, is, is the equivalent to the number of pairwise differences you have between sequences, right? There's roughly one SNP, one single nucleotide polymorphism every thousand base pairs in the human genome. Okay, uh, well, how do you interpret this? Well, so theta is equal to this thing, right? You know, we have rescaled things, right? So it should be, this is kind of what it's actually estimated. You always, so like I said, you know, in this model, you can always estimate these compound variables, right? But they always include this whole diffusion scaling thing. Uh, and um, yeah, the two comes from here, from there being a diploid population. Uh, but then people do crazy things, right? So they estimate then a mutation rate based on sort of divert fossil record uh, and some kind of, you know, molecular clock kind of argument, and they get a mutation rate of, you know, 10 to the minus something, right? Or, you know, these days you can also, of course, estimate mutation rates directly and, and, and so on, right? Uh, and they divide that out and they want to estimate this n for some obscure reason, right? Because, and I've never understood why people care, because, you know, this is not a population size, right? I mean, it's a population size if you actually believe that you had a right Fisher model, if you assume that this thing was one, right? But even under the simplest model, you also need to know the historical, historical variance and reproductive success and so on. It's 4NU, yes, sorry, sorry, that should be a dot there, sorry, the U should be on that side, sorry, sorry. Yes, uh, yeah, I'll fix that. Anyway, yes, it's 4NU, of course, yes, right? But, but right, my, my point is that you can only estimate things up to some arbitrary coalescence sc scaling factor, right? And, you know, trying to interpret that as an actual demographic parameter is just plainly silly, right? Uh, and I... I will, you know, so, yeah, let me see if I have it. Right, so people often then talk instead of an effective population size. Right, and this, this basically comes to, because of, you know, there's a whole bunch of models that basically, uh, you know, converges to a, to a right Fisher model, but with a different parameter, then you say that the effective population size is this, right? But then, you know, people want to estimate its effective population size. So, well, uh, you know, why? I mean, it, it's, uh, it has no obvious biological interpretation unless, and I'll show in a second, I mean, all, there's a whole bunch of things that turns out to scale this way, like the whole demographic structure. I mean, I also assume that there's discrete generations. Humans, of course, don't have this. Humans have, uh, you know, a life history table, right? You know, you know those Leslie matrices of reproductive success in each age structure and so on. Turns out, and I'll show that in, in a second, I mean, Maria also talked about this, right? Uh, in stage and age structured populations, that also turns into a scaling factor if, if you go through all this stuff, right? But, you know, you can't actually interpret this in any way as a single parameter unless you actually know how to invert that matrix and know what all the entries are and, and so on, right? But, you know, but this terminology has caused a lot of confusion. To me, the interesting thing, right, is that there is a very large number of demographic factors that, if you think about it for a second, actually just turns into a rescaling of this model, which means that you can use it as long as you keep in mind that you have this arbitrary scaling constant in there, right? And as long as you, and it means, of course, you can compare things as long as you, the, same, the scaling factor is the same, like across the whole genome for an individual, hopefully. We'll talk about that too. So, uh, but when you start comparing things between and, and, and so on and so forth. I mean, and of course, there's an also a very interesting question. And Molly Sivorsky has written lots of papers about this, that basically, for some reason, we don't fully understand. You know, in most, in most higher organisms, uh, you tend to get a, so humans have very low polymorphism. And we believe that's because you know, they must have had a very recent expansion from a smaller population. There's all kinds of reasons to believe this, right? But basically, across organisms, you know, you always get about a percent sequence divergence, right? And then if you put in some arbitrary mutation rate, uh, you get, that corresponds to maybe a coalescence time of, say, a million years on average, or something like that, right? Now, 
Lewinton was the first to point to this. Uh, this, this is the so-called heterozygosity paradox, right? Why do organisms that have such widely different, you know, real population sizes, anyone with common sense that goes out in nature sees that, you know, fish in the ocean have a very different population size than, you know, you know, gazelles or whatever, right? But you always tend to get the same thing. And, and you know, why exactly this happens? Uh, and it probably has to do something with stochastic demographic changes, harmonic means. Maybe it has something to do with, um, you know, selection actually affecting this thing in some sense. Well, this is a mystery that uh, we still we still don't know. Anyway, the point is that one shouldn't take take these things um, too literally. Right. Okay. So we talked a bit about variable population size. So I'll, I'll just go through this. So here's a just this is another just important intuition. So. Uh, Clearly, the rate of coalescence depends on the population size. So, you know, if the population size varies, then the rate of coalescence will vary. Drift is faster in small populations than in big populations. So, okay, so instead of having n be the population size, let n be a function of tau, where tau is the number of generations, uh, you know, going back in time. So in a constant population, uh, tau generations is tau divided by n units of coalescence time, and you know, inverting that is t units of coalescence time. Is and this just means taking the integer, right? This is mathematical pedantry, to uh, because generations are discrete. Okay, but now say if you have a variable population, then tau generations ago uh, corresponds to the sum of one over. Uh, these population sizes, basically reflecting the fact that more uh, coalescence time happens when n is very small, right? This is a sort of harmonic mean ideal of what, what, what happens. And you can invert that as well if you want, of course. Okay, so this is cute. So now consider, for example, that the population has grown rapidly, so you have like exponential growth. Then you would have n n tau generations ago would be going backward in time, right? It shrinks like this, where well, this would be the growth parameter. And instead of that sum, you can basically use the integral of this, which you can show becomes this, and you can, of course, invert that like this. Okay, so the, you know, the math isn't very important here, but the cool thing is this. If you think about what I said about what coalescence trees looks like, um, remember, in the standard neutral coalescence, there are two things to it, right? There is the topology, you know, who begat whom, which lineage coalesces with which, and there is this inter-arrival times, the branch lengths, right? Those are completely independent of each other. So if you want to simulate something, or, you know, analyze something with a variable population size, you can simulate the same topology. So here I've just simulated a topology like this, you know, this coalesces with this, this coalesces with this, and this coalesces with this. Uh, and if you then want to say, okay, uh, now I want to change, uh, you know, the population size has been variable, then you can, you can simulate the inter-arrival times and then just transform them, right, into coalescence time using uh, the scaling before, right? So if you had a constant, so with constant size, right, here's real time in generations, uh, and here's the log of uh, n of t in this particular simulation. Under constant size, you would get a tree that looks like the ones I showed you yesterday. And, uh, yeah, so, and, uh, right, if you have a scale time, you know, scale, you know, the coalescence time increases like this. This is divided by the, by the population size here. You have a linear relationship, right? And on the log, it looks like this. Uh, and, um, uh, but if you rescale it in terms uh, using the exponential growth, uh, here the population size decreases exponentially going back in time. So you have a straight line if you if you take the log logarithm of it, and the scale time does this kind of thing instead. That if you um, you know as time goes back in here, as the population shrinks, the population is really large here. So coalescence time goes very, very slowly, right? So not much happens. And then if you go back in time, the population shrinks, right? And then suddenly, think about these hungry beetles in a, in a box, right? Suddenly you make the box much smaller and they start eating each other at a very fast rate because, you know, there is no space anymore. Coalescence happens really quickly. This is like a bottleneck, right? Everything coalesces really quickly and you get things like this. And if you just transform 
transform the time axis here, take this tree, rescale time to exponential growth, the tree suddenly looks like this, right? And you get, uh, you know, something that looks much more uh, star-like, right? Basically, all these branches here, which used to be little tips, suddenly become long ones, right? And you can play this game with any transformation of time. So this is a cute thing, right? So uh, we assume that population size was constant. If you make population size not constant, you can still use the standard coalescent as long as you transform time appropriately. So this is, of course, for simulation stuff, you can see that this is, um, you know, extremely powerful, right? Because it's, you know, makes it so easy. And of course, for simple models, you can also derive lots of analytical results for this. Okay. Um, okay. So what actually, what does this actually mean? Well, you can also get some insight here. So, you know, can you detect changes in population size and so on? Well, it depends, right? In order for changes in population size to have an effect, right, they have to last kind of a long time, right? An instantaneous bottleneck doesn't actually do much to the pattern of polymorphism if it's like just one generation. It sort of has to last long enough so that there's time. Think about those beetles again, right? If you just shrink it down very quickly and then expand it up again, nothing happens. If you make the box small enough, it has to be like long enough, right? You shrink it down to like, you know, population size of 100, right? If that lasts for 100 generations, right? This is the whole, you know, uh, that's roughly the time scale of drift, right? Then you actually start even imprint and you actually start losing alleles on, on that scale. Okay, so, right, so, so population uh, size then does affect the coalescent. It's pretty straightforward to take it into account. It does not really result in an effective population size in the standard way. Now, you could, of course, imagine that you have some kind of stochastic fluctuations of population size that change over time then the coalescence time will be, if, if, if those are sort of faster than the time scale of, of the coalescent, right, you would actually be sampling over the whole trajectory of this thing, and you could, if you wanted to, define some kind of effective population size there, right? But it's not really a simple, uh, uh, and, you know, and that could look sort of roughly like a linear, linear thing, right? If the time scale at which it changes is sort of proportional to the coalescent, then, then you have to actually transform time instead, right? But it's fairly easy to model, but it clearly is an assumption that matters, right? It affects the coalescent. All right, now, population structure. Okay, so the standard model also assumes, as much does in population genetics, uh, that there is no geographical structure. Uh, and, uh, of course, most populations have some kind of structure. And the reason there's so much population genetics without it is simply because once you put population structure into a case, the, the math becomes impossibly hard. And since the name of the game was to show your colleagues how smart you are by, you know, doing models, you know, you can't do that otherwise, right? But I've always thought of this as, I'm just slightly mean here, but it's, a, you know, there's a lot of population genetics theory. I mean, modeling things without population structure is like, you know, modeling mechanics and ignoring friction in some sense, right? There's, you know, you actually in some sense end up with singularity results because it's just, it's a ludicrous model for what actually happens. And a lot of the speciation models follows its flaw, right? It's very difficult to evolve reproductive isolation if there's no structure at all in the population. Well, that turns out that, okay, well, that's sort of a exercise, right? Because if you go out in nature, there is structure, right? So what, we even have a model. That doesn't include that. Anyway, uh, you can also model a whole bunch of other things as structure. So Maria also already told about this, what right? stage structure populations and so on. And some, some kinds of population structure turns out not to have a big effect and others uh, do not. And I'll try to go through this. All right, structured right Fisher model. Very simple. Divide the population into, this is like the island model, right? Um, divide the population into patches or deems of fixed sizes n sub i, you know, have m of those, right? And the sum of all those population sizes add up to the whole thing. Assume that there are inf infinitely many propagules produced at each generation, and that these then migrate independently of each other, right? So there's no density regulation. Once you get density regulation into account, then you effectively have a model of selection, because actually, you know, it turns into something like that. There's some classical papers by Barton and Torelli and Felsenstein, right? Uh, about this. Uh, otherwise, right, so uh, a propagule produced this in I with probability M, M, I, J ends up in J instead. And then after migration, um, 
finite number of adults in the next generation are just sampled as before, you know, with uh, right fishes sampling. This is a lot of real formality here, but... Okay, now let's turn look at this model. So this is the classical idol model, where it is described, right? Uh, now, do it backward in time. Pick an individual in, in a population. It picks its parent then independently from the previous generation. And the probability that a lineage uh, currently, to fix that, in I, picks a parent in J is Bij, right? Which is like the backward migration rate. The other one was the forward. So this is the rate of, this is immigration rates, and the other one was emigration rates, as if you want, right? And, you know, this is the obvious thing, right? It's just weighted by the different sizes of the deems, right? If, you know, bigger deems, ties, blah, blah, blah. Okay, and then we're just going to let n go to infinity as before. And then what happens depends on how the other parameters scale in relation to this. So, basically, to give you some intuition, what's going to happen here? So, say that you take a simple model divided into two deems, right? If migration between these is fairly slow, and what do you think slow means here? What should we think of as slow? So, think about it for a second. Okay. I'll, so, when do you think you get a behavior so that basically, like what you show here, right? To intuit, you're going to imagine that things from the same deem or village or population or lake or patch or meadow or whatever it is tends to coalesce with each other, right? And sometimes, you know, okay, so this one coalesces with this one, these guys coalesce. Here's one that actually migrates over here and ends up coalescing with these guys, but you get a tree that kind of tends to reflect where they came from. That happens if migration is slow, whereas you can imagine uh, migration being very, very fast, so that actually lineages end up jumping back and forth all the time much faster than they ever coalesce, right? So that uh, you know, where you actually end up in a coalescent basically ends up being proportional to the stationary distribution and how often you visit a particular patch, right? So fast and slow here. Uh, it has to do with whether you scale things on the sort of, on the n population size scale, right? You're going to let n get very, very large. And if migration is on the order of, of the population size, right? So, or of one over the population size, Yes? Uh, well, let me see. Well, we're talking about migration per individual here, right? So, let's see how much, if you make it large. So, we defined uh, migration as a probability that a particular individual jumps, right? And if that basically ends up... The question is, like, if you get the population size... Mathematically, as you let population size go to infinity, if that probability essentially goes to one, right? Then, you know, so you're certain to have jumped before anything. Coalescence happens really, really slowly, right? Because population sizes are quite large. If, before you see that, you're almost certain that you will have jumped uh, back and forth, right? You know, if you just think about a particular, a particular individual, let's see. So you were also asking about the whole, the whole population size. Yeah, that must be the same, of course. But I guess they follow from each other because, you know, if if it were the case, like, if you defined it that, like, you know, half the population is going to change any time, right? And you, you know, if the population size goes to infinity, that effectively means that you have an infinite migration rate, right? If the if the, if the probability is like fixed and relatively small by individual, the population size gets large, then that becomes like a rare thing in any, any particular population, right? And you know, these, these are just, just extremes, right? But they're, they're good for intuition. So if you take, so take slow migration, right? Assume, yeah, so assume that the number of deems and the proportion of the individuals that are made up by each deem and this scaled migration parameter here remain constant as n goes to infinity, right? So that they basically, you can treat them as being, you know, relatively rare. Then, if you measure time in units of n generations, the process converges to 
what is known as the structured coalescent. And you know, if John Wakeley was here, he would have talked a lot, a lot about this as well. Basically, in this case, each pair of lineages in patch I will coalesce independently at rate, you know, normally coalescence is at rate one for a pair, right? Here it's one over CI because, you know, it happens faster in, in a smaller deem and, and so on. Yeah? Um, and migration happens independently at rate PIJ over two because we put in the arbitrary two here for convenience reasons. And there are no other events, right? Things can either, because because we made things rare, the, the whole trick here right, is to, so that you can use this exponential, uh, you know, you won't have competing exponentials, right? So when you write a simulation for this, right, the, you know, you just wait until something happens. What's, what's going to happen? Either something migrates or something, or a pair of things coalesce, right? There's no other things. You can't have, like, there are no gener the generations have disappeared. In any instant of time, you can't have things both migrating and coalescing at the same time and all that stuff, because everything is rare. Yeah, okay, so yeah, events occur according to a Poisson process. You just keep track of lineages in each patch. Uh, the waiting time to the f uh, first event will be the sum of all the rates. You know, the, this is the coalescent rates. K choose to, you know, depending on how many individuals in, in each of the K, in, in patch I, right? There are KI lineages, they coalesce as K choose, I, uh, choose to scaled by the relative size of this thing because this is, you know, we're doing everything on the size of the whole population, plus the rate at which things uh, uh, migrate around. And when it occurs, right, you can figure out, is it a coalescence? So it's a coalescence in patch I with just this divided by, you know, the sum of all the rates, right? It's just, again, this game of competing exponentials, right? You have, you're waiting for something, you know at which rates they occur, you can calculate the waiting time until something is occurs is exponential with the sum of all the independent things, which once something happens, you pick which one happens, uh, you know, with the relative weights of, of the different rates, right? So if you, you can see, this, this computer program writes itself, right? It's extremely easy to write a simulation program uh, that does this for almost arbitrarily complex models, right? Okay. Uh, and. If it's a migration, yeah, you know, there's just the weighted rates of all this, which, which one it is, right? If it's a coalescent theme, if it, if it is a coalescent in patch I, then a randomly chosen pair in patch I coalesces and you decrease Ki by one. Yeah. If it's a migration, then you take a lineage from this deem and move it to the other deem. Yes. Ci is the... Uh, um, it's the relative sizes of all the deems, right? Because we're allowing the different islands to have different sizes, right? So if you have a, you know, there's a tiny island, there is a big island. Because we're measuring everything on this, on this, uh, in this time scale of the total population size, right? In a small deem, it's going to happen a lot faster, right? You know, it's like, uh, it's like inbreeding in a small village, right? As everyone marries each other in a small village, right? They all get to be related pretty quickly, right? In a big town, that, in a big city, this doesn't happen. Okay, so when you have slow migration, you tend to get coalescence within patches, right? Uh, so, uh, and you get increased, extremely increased mean and variance of the coalescence time, right? Because in order, you know, say that migration is, is quite rare, you know, things will relatively quickly coalesce within each of these patches. But then, before they can coalesce, you have to wait for migration between uh, between the two, right? You can get various things, and it, but it also, the variance can be extremely high, right? And suddenly, now, and this is, of course, important for, I told you before, like, in humans, say, the uh, coalescence time, right? Uh, you know, you get the coalescence time of a couple of hundred thousand to a million years or something like this, right? Well, duh. I mean, obviously, this will, to some extent, reflect population structure as well, right? And now there's no longer, it's no longer a linear thing at all. I mean, the waiting time here will depend on, on both migration rates and, and coalescent rates, right? And I submit to you that basically the level of polymorphism in almost any species you're going to look at is going to be affected by, by its demography in the sense of how spread out it is as well, right? Yeah? Okay. Uh, Fast migration, this is more like a curiosity, but it's, it's good for intuition. Okay, so obviously, the more migration you have, the less the effect of subdivision. 
and it's obvious, uh, but there is an interesting result here, um, which is useful for lots of other things. Um, so you take the same assumptions as before, except now we're going to assume that these things are not order one over n, right? So as the population has becomes large, you just these guys basically go along with it, becomes infinite, right? So you know, formally, mathematically speaking. This leads to like a separation of time scales, if you think about using dynamical systems language. So that basically, you know, the process which governs migration operates on a completely different time scale than the process that generates coalescences, right? Basically, you know, you know things will migrate around like this. Uh, and the rate at which things coalesce them will basically be determined by the stationary distribution of the migration process, right? So, um, and this is just mathematically convenient, but you know, it's, you can see, it's interesting what happens. Um, okay, so let pi i be the stationary probability that lineage is in patch i. And what you can show then is that you, you actually get the standard coalescent. If time is, it is it, you get the standard coalescent if you measure you, uh, time in units of n over alpha where alpha is, uh, you know, this thing, right? So basically, this is the product of the stationary probabilities of being in the same deem, right? You know, this is, a, because you have two linears coalesce, if they're, you know, this is basically being in patch i, how often are two linears in this? Well, this is the product of, they all move independently, right? And this is pi i is the stationary probability for a particular lineage of being in i. This is often they're in the same patch, and this is the relative rate in those patches. And the cute thing here is that, so right, you would get completely, uh, and this thing can be shown to be always be greater than one. So basically, the effective population size is smaller. You know, the coalescence is actually faster than in the right Fisher model, unless uh, this is true. Basically, coalescence occurs faster unless emigration equals immigration everywhere. This is like a balance criterion, right? So a very strong symmetry argument, symmetry thing, right? So what's the intuition behind this? So uh, I guess you, I guess Ophelia is working on her things because this actually has to do with the uh, source and sink environments that she was talking about. It's pretty, it's kind of intuitive, right? If you divide a population into different patches, you know, balance, if all the patches are completely identical, right? And everything just migrates back and forth in proportion to size, you know, then it doesn't actually affect anything, right, if, if migration is very fast. But, as is more likely, if there are some deems that are sort of more productive, produce more immigrants than each other, then, uh, you know, intuitively, right, those will tend to produce more of future generations, right? So the effective population size is in some sense um, uh, smaller, right, because there's like... Uh, there's inequality, right? You, in the, it's a very similar result that we'll... Do I have slides about this? I can't remember if I do or not. It's a very similar result to, you know, variance in reproductive success. This is also intuitive, right? If, um, if some individuals tend to produce more offspring, right, then the effective population size is smaller because there's, again, inequality, right? There's a, a more, more drift because some individuals produce more. And this is what happens here, right? This is like the rich neighborhoods tend to produce more of future generations, right? If you think about a, a stream or, you know, take a meadow or like the drift, you know, wind blows in one direction. You know, if you go backward, in, you know, the, the upstream, the up, upwind ones will tend to produce all the seeds that go down here or, or whatever animal or plant, whatever. If you go backward in time, all the lineages will tend to go upstream, right? And this is where they coalesce, right? They end up, end up coming from that place. So effectively, it's like you, you bottle thing, neck things down. And, and this actually can, can be a metaphor for selection, as we'll show in a second. So just uh, remember that. Okay, now. Okay, is this idle model a good model? Well, it's good for intuition building, but one should be very careful about using it too much. Um, because, of course, in, in um, reality, most species, I argue, uh, show isolation by distance, right? And another thing that is very tricky, I think, is that it assumes, especially you know, if you use this slow model, you know, slow migration, it effectively assumes that the demography stays constant on the coalescence timescale. And if you think about that, with just a little bit of common sense, right, that's a ludicrous proposition. 
right? I mean, uh, coalescence times are on the order of, you know, a million years, right? I come from a place that was completely under ice. And there was nothing there at all 6,000 years ago, right? India has gone through, you know, you know, dry and, and wet periods in, in this period, like, we, you know, when the ice comes in the north, further south, it gets rainy and wet, then everything is rainforest, and then suddenly everything becomes savanna, and things get isolated, and things move up on mountaintops, and all kinds of things happen, right? So this is something one should really, really think about. Um, and there's been far too little work about thinking how, how to do this. Although, importantly, I think... Um, with these uh, coalescent models, it's extremely simple to simulate almost any model. It is almost impossible to parameterize those models with any kind of data. That's the problem, right? You, you, you kind of, if, if somebody, you know, if somebody told me that this is what actually happened, right? You know, here's your God-given demography. I can easily write a simulation program to to show whatever it would do. The problem is that you don't know what those parameters are, and this is a real pain. Yeah, and of course, yes, this, this is a very tricky thing. So uh, see, see collected works of Nick Barton for more of this. Um, yeah, okay, I'll go to this in a second. What I was going to draw, and actually I'll get back to this anyway. And uh, so f let's forget about this for a second. What um, another very useful model for this, uh, use, use for this island model is thinking about uh, gene trees and species trees, right? So... Um, and there, I think it actually might be a pretty decent model, because if you think about, say, okay, so you can think about species as, as being islands, right? So, so here's humans, and here's uh, chimps, and here's gorillas. So you can have a tree... Maybe, and so this is kind of the idea of, of sort of what happened. You can think about, so everyone can see this, here's humans, here's chimps, and here's gorillas, right? Each of these things, here's some, you know, this would be N sub H, and here would be, you know, N sub C, and here would be N sub G, right? Each of these have their population size. Then you can sample genes in here, right? And they will show some kind of tree like this. Regardless of what you sample, most of these are human genes. You know, take a particular gene here, and it will tend to coalesce, coalesce like this. Same thing if you sample in, in a chimp, although the chimps should have slightly deeper coalescence times in general. Uh, here is gorilla and so on, right? Then the linear just go back here. And if these things interbreed more, uh, interbreed more quickly, then there will be a tendency for these to coalesce. And then I should have used a different color here. That wasn't very pedagogic, but whatever. Uh, but this you can model with the same way, right? You just have to... Um, it's a bit of trickery if you want to simulate these things, if you think what happens here, right? So you also have some... Um, you know, that would be a T naught here, some separation time, right? You can, you can simulate this by just running the coalescent here backward in time until you reach time T, right? Then you see where you are, and you, you, know, you, know, you would just do it until you overshoot, and then you see where you are, uh, and then you, you take it from there. These models are interesting because then you can ask questions. So, so, so as I drew it here, you know, all human, thing, all human genes are more closely related to each other than they are to, to uh, chimps, and this by and large is true. Does anyone think of an example where this is not true? So there are bits of our genomes where one of my alleles may be more closely related to a chimp allele than to my other allele. So some, you know, generally speaking, all, more, all humans are certainly more closely related to each other than any of us is to a chimp. But on a gene basis, this is not quite true. HLA, MHC, the immune system. The immune system alleles, right, are under extremely strong balancing selection, and there are haplotypes that basically go all the way back in the primate lineage, right? So these very complex HLA haplotypes. So their basic balancing selection maintains really, really deep lineages, right? And you actually get so that basically things here do not coalesce because they're, they're kept by selection apart. And then, you know, the different alleles, so now I should, of course, be semi-pedagogical here, and you will get, so you will have 
lineages in humans going back here and in chimp as well, right? And then these will coalesce and then, you know, they go back here and maybe there's a gorilla lineage just come in and you get a, a gene tree that is sort of deeper uh, than the species tree. So uh, I think the ABO blood groups also, they're also part of the immune system under very strong balancing selection and there are low side under balancing selection where this happens. Um, what is not so clear, uh, so generally speaking across the genome, you also get a tree like this, that chimps are more closely related to us and gorillas are the outgroup, right? But that's not true for all, if I remember it correctly, it's like maybe 10% of the genome where this is not true, where the gorilla chimp thing switches. And this can happen, presumably happens, because this time here, the process doesn't actually look like this. Uh, it's much more fussy what happened back here and a very use, a, a, another use for thinking about coalescence is to look at the sort of forest of trees you get between closely related species and try to infer what actually happened uh, during speciation, whether it was like ancient hybridization. I mean, I have a pretty strong view of this and I'll try to talk about this tomorrow. You know, very important, like speciation, there are no speciation events, right? Speciation is a process. It takes a very long time. During that time, often you have subdivided sort of proto species. You know, whereas human chimps and gorillas certainly do not exchange genes today. There probably was a long period where things that sort of were quite distinct actually did. And, uh, you know, because of that, you get this sort of admixing stuff. And we have ways of testing for that, but I'll, I'll talk more about that tomorrow. Anyway, this is sort of an idle model. And now, based on how nice this drawing is, you can see why I prefer to use slides most of the game. I'm the worst. So rates of evolution, right? So, you know, this is rates of coalescence we're talking about here. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Let's try to make this concrete. And I, 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 I sort of know what you mean. So if you want to take like a, a rapidly... What I'm talking about is, is just the sort of the history of, of the gene itself. You're ob obviously right. In order to actually infer this, you actually look at the sequence polymorphism, right? And then, of course, you can get the estimate completely wrong if, 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 the, if that thing is moving completely, you know, has a much faster rate, right? That can also happen, right? But, you know, for most of this stuff, we're talking about, you know, you would do inference based on synonymous sites only, right? Yeah, they, they still do. They, they, they still do. And so, you know, so... I guess I would say that the error in that estimation I mean, over the timescales we're looking at here, you know, we're looking at within species stuff mostly, right? Sometimes between species for very close related species. Uh, I don't think mutation rates are likely to vary that much. It's not like in phylogeny estimation, right? Where you have vast differences. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So, but, but yeah, but, but that still shouldn't change the topology, right? I mean, you will still see whether you know, whether they share a mutation or not, right? I mean, that would last for sure, right? So if you, if you take a single gene here and a single gene here, and you try to estimate how long ago did that, they have a common ancestor, you will get different estimates depending on what mutation rate you plug into that, right? And if that then differs, of course it does, right? I mean, there are some genes that, if you know, some sperm protein is rapidly evolving or olfactory receptor or whatever, whereas like, a, you know, histone or something like this, right? which is very slow, okay. But you would still, that doesn't change the topology of, of the thing, right? So yeah, you should be very careful when you compare uh, between genes, right? But no matter how fast they are like that, if you start seeing allele sharing between, you know, that actually implies ancestry, you know, common ancestry, unless, of course, it's evolving so fast that you get repeat mutations and stuff like that, which of course also happens in, in some science. So you have to keep an eye out for that as well. Does that help? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, conserved, it, it, it's the variation that's preserved. <laughs> 
No, you can be more, more related, right? So the correct way of putting it is one of your alleles, right? Say that, you know, your HLA haplotype that you got from, from your dad, right? Could be so diverged from the one from your mom uh, that, you know, if you took a random one from a chimp, you know, they have a common ancestor before. Because, and this is because balancing selection has kept these different uh, HLA, uh, you know, MHC haplotypes around for a very long time. Yeah? Balancing selection can lead to what's known as transpecific polymorphism, right? That you actually keep lineages, you know, they're basically preventing. So this is like, this is how selection affects coalescence, right? I mean, if balancing selection, and you can't, I, I, I'll talk about that later if I, if I get to it, right? Uh, basically, balancing selection keeps things from, um, uh, coalescing, right? You know, that's what selection does. It maintains different allelic classes in the population through various mechanisms, right? So they can't coalesce, right? And then they just go back uh, very far. And yeah, this is, this is clearly the case for MHC. It's also probably the case for the ABO blood system, for the rhesus factor, and there's, uh, there's been a couple of papers. That, you know, there's a smattering of genes across the genome. There, for the longest times, people argue that they basically didn't exist before the MAC, but now we're starting to look more carefully and you see that they do exist. They're actually quite difficult to detect, though, because of that. I'll give you references that the, the actual tract that is preserved, if it's just like a single site or something, you know, a single site you can recapitulate, of course, by repeat mutations, but these MUC haplotypes seem to be pretty complex, you know, compound loci with a bunch of, you know, they've diverged at multiple sites, right? Yeah, so what you would observe, well, you would certainly, you would observe for sure, since balancing selection is acting, you would, you know, if you try to estimate population structure within humans, you would get a very different population structure because there's, you know, selection and sharing sort of between different groups and so on. Uh, what would you do with chimps? Yeah, it would be a crappy one, right? I mean, if you, if you try to build a phylogeny based on the HLA, right, you could get some really bizarre results, right? So it, it would be a very, very bad gene to, to build phylogenies on because it, you know, it's, it really does not reflect the sort of demography and reproductive isolation between these species. It reflects, you know, uh, whatever selection it is that is actually on the MHC. You might, you know, you might come to the conclusion that, you know, you might certainly, you know, you would get the wrong genealogy, right? I mean... And you know you might and you might reach the bizarre conclusion like if you ha if you had several humans that some humans are actually chimps and and so on right uh, which is you know clearly not correct so uh, yeah absolutely I mean in general acting you know looking at very strongly selected loci like this is a is a bad bad idea if you're going to do if you're going to do uh, phylogeny okay God how am I doing here. Right. So this, okay, now, in order to have any chance of not going crazy here, I'm going to skip over a bunch of slides, I think, but let's see. Um, yeah, sex. So there are two aspects of sex. Um, there is, uh, you know, from the point of view of population genetics, uh, segregation. Uh, in diploid organisms, right, genes come in packages of two. This turns out to be extremely easy to model. You can just basically change the scaling from n to 2n instead. And I think I'll just let you read that by yourself because it's, uh, it's pretty trivial. Uh, and then sex is also connected to recombination, which really is important. And I do need to go through this. So, okay, all right. So here's what I'm going to skip. So you have that uh, that handbook chapter I wrote, these pictures are basically taken for that. I'm, I'm going to skip through a bunch of slides because otherwise I'm just going to run out of time here, right? The whole point is that you can, uh, you can treat the fact that we have diploid, you can basically model that as an, as an island model, right? Where the population, uh, basically, uh, so you're starting with hermaphroditism here, right? Uh, so these are now flowers or something. Uh, this ends up looking like a haploid population of size 2n that's divided into n patches of size 2, right? So each individual becomes, you know, each of us becomes an island, right? It's not 
meant metaphorically. It's actually whatever. And then, you know, they're, you know, size two, and then lineages migrate, migrate between individuals, right? And um, basically, if you crank the handle on this, whether they're, you know, they can be male and female individuals or maphrodite individuals, you end up getting back a bunch of, you know, very simple results from this. And you can use these time scaling, separation time scales arguments that I just told you, because as you can imagine, well, take males and females, for instance, right? We divide, you know, t okay, look around you. We all have, you know, we have two, two copies of each gene, right? Uh, and we divide it into males and females. But unless you're looking at the sex-linked locus, right? Each of your gene came from your mom and dad. It's completely random, which it is, right? So obviously, on the sort of coalescent timescales, each of our genes will migrate between the female and the male part of the population infinitely fast, right? They've experienced, before there's any coalescence, all of our genes will have been in women, women and in men you know, a very, very large number of times, and whether you end up coalescing in a female or coalescing in a male, uh, you know, is completely random, right? And then, of course, if there are different reproductive demographics between males and females, that affects the effective population size and so on. You can churn through all this and it ends up working just the same. Uh, for selfing, you know, it matters whether, you know, individuals can, whether individuals have a tendency to, to self and so on. But I'm just going to click through a bunch of slides here because I need to go through recombination today and this is taking, and you can just read this for yourself. It's not, if you have any questions, just come and ask me. Yes, play, males and females, blah, blah, blah. Okay, this is mostly algebra, and I'm just going to skip all this. And then I wanted to, all, you know, I just wanted to finish this thing about structure stuff here. You know, Maria showed all these models about stage structure, right? So here's like, you know, different stages that sort of give, you know, they grow into bigger stages that can, you know, either die or they can stay at that stage, they grow into the next stage, they reproduce and so on. All this stuff can be modeled using the coalescent as well, extremely, and, and Maria has done some of that work, right? Because, again, this is something that happens on a per generation basis, right? That is obviously an extremely fast process on the coalescent time scale. So this all can be turned into a linear effective population size. These things are easy to treat, right? Just like sex, selfing, all these things, very easy. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. I, and I wanted to add the thing about demography about this. So, you know, it's again, just... What I want to leave you with is this intuition, for like thinking about the scales at which we, things happen, right? You can imagine, I mean, something that has not been done enough work on is like, it, with these idle models, we treat, you know, we treat demography as being sort of constant of the coalescence time scale, which is clearly not very clever, but you can gain some insight to what might happen that way. You could easily extend this in some kind of stochastic demography. And, you know, again, in the intuitive, would be that if, if these changes are very, very slow on the coalescent time scale, you know, geological time scale, you know, continental drift, for instance, is clearly something we can ignore because within that time scale, things will coalesce. Uh, ice ages, on the other hand, is something we cannot ignore because the climate changes, you know, that has changed, have, have happened, you know, the last one was 10,000 years ago, right? And, you know, these last maybe 200,000 years and so on, there's been massive changes in the climate during the coalescence time of most of the organisms we're looking at here. Uh, this really matters, right? And then, of course, there are other things. If changes are very, very fast, the coalescent ends up averaging between states in, instead. And this, this could be why you get, you know, you sample some plants in, in a meadow, right? And, you know, they're going to be in, you know, their ancestors be in another meadow over there, you know, they probably sample the entire environment before anything coalesces, right? So, you know, this stuff can perhaps be ignored. And nobody has done anything really but stochastic demography changing on the same time scale, right? That would be sort of an, you know, a fun field exercise for somebody who likes doing uh, stochastic processes. Okay, now, but I, I, I need to absolutely, I need absolutely to talk about recombination because it's super important. Okay, so why do we worry about recombination? If you go to all these, I mean, like all these papers by Tajima and those classical things and so on, they were all about looking at the single locus because that basically people just had data from single genes. Now, of course, we have whole genome data, right? And it's obvious that you have to think about, you have to think about uh, recombination. Uh, and it's important because it explains Lingard's equilibrium. It's important for all these scans of selection, you go across the genome and you look for genes that behave differently, right? And you have to take this autocorrelation uh, that happens along, along the genome, right? Linkage equilibrium is correlations in allelic state because things are linked, right? They can also, 
also be correlated for other reasons. But um, uh, and of course, if you want to estimate demography in any way accurately, you need to have like genome-wide data, and, and you can do this. So, how does recombination work in the coalescent? This is kind of cute, and it's important to think about, right? All right, think think first about uh, recombination, like going forward in time, right? All right, uh, we all produce gametes, right? Okay. Our gametes are a combination of mom and dad, yes, meiosis. You produce gametes, part of the chromosome, you know, every, every gamete we will produce, there is like at least one chiasmata per chromosome, right? Chiasma per chromosome, um, uh, many chiasmata. And uh, so basically each, all of our gametes, every chromosome will be a mixture of what we got from mom and dad, undergrad genetics, everyone knows this, yes, okay. Uh, so this is how you think about it, you get a mixture. Now, if you turn this process backward in time, um, what happens is, of course, that it splits up lineages instead, right? So here's a chunk of DNA. You know, think about it as a chromosome or whatever. And here's an actual pedigree. The round things are females, the square ones are males, right? So these are like three offspring of, you know, mom and dad here. This particular one, like I just said, part of it, if you trace the ancestry of this black bit here, it's going to be a mixture of the mom and dad bit of this. So say that this one was the one that was, this chromosome was the one this daughter got from her mom. And in that mom, it was a, it was a combination of what came from uh, dad and what came from mom. And if you continue this process and many generations back in time, what you see is that basically you get a continuing process of splitting up of lineages, right? Yes? But you can, okay, so everyone sees that. You, you, your ancestral material would spread over your entire uh, pedigree like this, right? Over long periods of time, of course, you get sort of unrelated individuals, right? So, of course, also a consequence of this, you have a, you know, your pedigree, you know, you have two parents, four grandparents, you know, and so this grows exponentially, right? But of course, your genetic material, you know, you quickly get to a point where you actually, even though so-and-so was your ancestor, you got like no genetic material from that person because the genetic material only, you know, goes in finite paths, right? You have the coalescent operating inside the pedigree, right? Which just keeps growing. Your genetic material draws lineages like that and, and you know, it spreads up. And of course, you can also get coalescences here, right? So let's trace this, this bit here. The many generations is still moving as one lineage. There was no more recombination here. This bit goes back here and here. Uh, it split again, so now basically this black bit, the, this bit here goes over to this individual, and this bit came from this individual, uh, goes back here, but then of course you can also get coalescences, right? So here, there is a loop, right? But this doesn't qualify as inbreeding. I mean, inbreeding is when you get loops of ancestry like in, in, in a very close scale, uh, but you know, there is a connection between genetic drift and inbreeding, and this is essentially it, right? Basically, if you go back far enough, things get related again, right? So basically, you get this genetic material, there's a coalescence again, and you suddenly, so here are two lineages that coalesce, and you get an individual that here we have a chromosome that now is the ancestor of the upper part of this chromosome and the lower part, but not this one, right? So this guy, the ancestor of the middle bit, actually is sitting over here now. Okay? All right, so... This is sort of what happens, right? And um, this is just a single lineage, right? And it just splits up in time here. So isn't it just going to spread all over the place? Well, no, actually, it won't. And there's a very simple reason for this, because it turns out, and I'll show in a second, that the rate at which things split is linear in the number of ancestors you have, right? Each of these chromosomes that go back in time has a probability of recombining, and that's linear in the number of ancestors. But the rate of coalescence is quadratic. Right? Because it's things coming together. Remember those beetles colliding with each other, right? So, so from a probabilistic point of view, you are certain at some point to reach, to get every... So here, right, the ancestry now is on two lineages, two lineages for a bit here, right? So here, for this period of time, there's actually three separate ancestors of this chromosome, right? But here it drops down uh, to two again, right? There's this one, and then there's the little bit, which is inherited over here, right? And at some point, these guys are going to go class two, and you're guaranteed uh, 
you know, in finite time, you, that you're gonna that you are gonna collapse down to one again. This is just uh, the way basic stochastic processes, right? Okay, uh, and also in a large population, in a large population, you will never recombine with somebody. You know, recombination always ends splitting up. You can ignore that you ever meet somebody who is already in your ancestor lineage, right? Because remember, we're tracing a finite thing here in a very large population. In a, in a, there will be other kinds of loops in, in a, you know, if you had a very small, small population. Okay, and so, okay, here's another example. So recombination then makes it possible for linked sites to have different genealogies. To see different, so on the previous slide, I just showed you the ancestry of one chunk, right? Now we're going to sample three chunks here. Um, and, you know, whatever you want to call that color, violet, magenta, whatever, uh, a green one and a blue one. Okay, so here, here is the ancestry of this one. I draw little pedigrees here, and the dotted lines means that we kind of lose track of the family stuff, and you know, you just move into, into sort of population genetics land for a bit. So this one just doesn't recombine. Um, the blue one, I've just made it simple, doesn't recombine either. But if you move back here, the green lineage here undergoes recombination, right? So suddenly the ancestry of this green you know, chromosome, but you can also think about it as just a segment of DNA on a chromosome, right? The ancestry of this one splits into two. So the bottom bit goes this way, and the top bit goes this one. And here, uh, here there is a coalescence event. So that the where the the ancestor the ancestor lineage that carries the entire ancestry of magenta coalesces with the ancestry that carries the bottom bit of green. So you get like an ancestor lineage here that is like the ancestor of green and magenta for the bottom bit and magenta only for the top bit. Okay? Um, and then going back further again, woohoo, the blue one joins in, right? So now you have an, a common ancestor that is the ancestor of everyone. Green, magenta, and blue for the bottom bit, and blue and magenta for the top bit. So, so the bottom bit here has already coalesced, right? There's only one ancestor left for the bottom bit. The top bit still has two ancestors, ancestors because that thing went this way, and they coalesce over here, and then everything is back to a single ancestor again. Okay, so what does this mean? This means that for the bottom bit, you get a genealogy, a gene genealogy that looks like this, that magenta and green coalesce first, and they coalesce here, right? And then later, blue uh, joins in, and that happens here. For the top bit, uh, top bit goes here. It coalesces, uh, what happens for the top bit? You have green and blue, yeah, they coalesce here, right? And the green one doesn't, the green one doesn't join in until over here, right? So you get a different tree instead. You see that? So you get basically two different trees because recombination happens, right? So yeah, you need to look at this a bit, right? Now, you can do this in a coalescent setting. And then you get what is known as the ancestral recombination graph. Uh, so we let the per generation, so this is the same game as before. We let the per generation, we're looking at some segment of DNA, right? We let the per generation probability of recombination in that segment be R for the recombination rate. And then we rescale that thing just like we've done before. So that you know, we're going to play the same game. And we measure time in units of two n generations. What you get then is a process under which each lineage independently undergoes recombination at rate rho over 2. Each pair of lineages independently coalesce at rate 1, coalesces. Whenever you have a recombination, it increases the number of lineages you have to keep track of by 1. And each coalescence decreases the number of lineages by 1. When there are k lineages, the total rate of recombination is k times rho, right? Um, that follows from this. And, uh, yeah. and the total rate of coalescence is uh, uh, k choose 2. 
And the number of linear disks is guaranteed to stay finite and even hit one occasionally, right? But it hits one, right? But then it will, you know, it will hit one. But then, of course, recombination will split that lineage up again, right, into multiple things, right? But that's kind of pointless to follow that back then, because then, you know, you already coalesce to have, you have found, you know, the ultimate most recent common ancestor for the whole thing, right? But basically, the most recent common ancestor point-wise across the genome will be different, right? Uh, yes. Right, so the first time the number of linears is one, we have the ultimate MRCA, which is different from the MRCA for any given point. Okay, and you can basically play, you know, do any model of recombination, you can do gene conversion, you can do anything with this, with this general framework, right? Uh, a particularly simple one would just be that you put on recombination breaks uniformly in, in the 0, 1 int interval, and I, I have an example here just to give you an idea what happens. Uh, so here's a very simple ancestral recombination graph that I, I painstakingly put together. Um, so in this, so what happens here? Uh, basically, so here you have six lineages, right? Just as before. Going back in time, the first thing that happens is is that there is a recombination point in the ancestry of five, right? And it happens at you know uniformly chosen point six one in this interval. And just by convention, we will say that the bit to the left, so that makes, causes a break, then so here's the representation of the chromosome, here's 0.61. Uh, the material to the left of 0.61, you know, go to the left here, that's just by convention to draw it. So you trace that this way, and the bit of the right goes this way. And the next thing that happens, I think, oh, there's a recombination rate, in, uh, a break in, in lineage 6 here, it happens at port 14, the left bit goes this way, the right bit goes this way. Um, and the next thing, so going back in time, first that, then that. Oh, and the next thing that happened is that the stuff, the, the ancestor of the left bit of chromosome 5, coalesces with the ancestor of the entirety of chromosome 4. Uh, and, you know, you go back, back like this, right? And basically, if you take any particular time, any particular slice here, I'm just trying to give you an idea what this, what this process looks like. Like, if you look at this branch here, so this branch, what this is telling us, right? So at this point, this is, uh, carries the ancestry, uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. right, okay. This one carries the, is, f because in this entire tree, there are breakpoints, there ends up being breakpoints at 0 0.14, 0 0.61, 0 0.93, and 0 0.98, right? So you have to think uh, about what happens here for each of these breakpoints. This particular lineage here is, if you go through this, is not, is not the ancestor of anyone for 0.14, right? It just carries, it's just a ghost, right? It has, that thing doesn't leave any descendants in the sample. This chunk here, it's the ancestor of six, right? For point fourteen to point six, is the left path of, of, of uh, sorry, it's the right path of the point fourteen goes up here, and from and from point six one to one, it's the ancestor of both five and six because they uh, coalesce there. Okay, so if you then look at the induced trees for the different points here, if you look for this first bit here, you can basically go through. Uh, and see what happens, and the 0.93 breakpoints, you go to the left, 0.61, left, 0.14, you go to the left, and you sort of get the induced tree in red for, for this chunk of the chromosome. Here is the tree for 0.14 to 0.61, um, here is the tree for this one, and here is the tree for this one, and here is the tree for this one, like this. Uh, here, for instance, is a Here's a recombination point that doesn't matter at all, by the way, because uh, this splits these lineages into, this lineage into two, but the next thing that happens is that those two coalesce back together again, effectively healing that thing, right? And it turns out that a large number of recombination points have the property that you can never see them because they, they will go uh, in together again, right? So if you draw them next to each other, you basically get like a walk through tree space, right? Here's what I just showed you. You get these trees and you can see that they're similar, right? They correlate and this is, you know, this is a, you know, a lot of very smart people have spent time thinking about this object. This is really a complicated stochastic process uh, to think about. You can you can derive um, 
a process where, I mean, so I simulated it backward like this, right? You can also think about what if you have a tree here? Can you figure out what's the distribution of the next tree, right? And you can do that, right? But it's not the pretty, pretty thing, right? You can go along the chromosome, have a tree. What happens to the next tree along the road? And there's a very, you can approximate that in various ways, right? Instead of simulate this, this entire beast, right? Because even though you're probabilistically guaranteed to stay finite, if you take a large chunk of DNA that you want to model, several megabases, right? Then there's going to be a lot of recombination and you get a huge object that you need to keep track on. Okay, but you get this, and then you sort of, then you drop mutations down here. And these will then tend to be correlated, right? Because, because of how recombination happened. And one manifestation of this is, you know, linkage to equilibrium, you know, correlation in, in allelic, allelic state, right? So if you want to simulate data, you simulate this graph backward in time until the ultimate reason your mass has to be found, or you can just basically keep track of when every piece has, you have coalesced piecewise, right? And then you add mutations forward in time, just like before. But you now have a graph instead of a tree. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's, how common is recombination? Well, in humans, uh, one centimorgan, that's 1% recombination is about one megabase. In Drosophila, one centimorgan is 250 kb. In yeast, it is much more common uh, than this. Arabidopsis is about one centimorgan by 250 kb as well. So if you just assume that it's uniform, which it isn't, but let's say that it is for, for the Kasekwin argument, you would get something like this per site, right? Note that this is actually higher than the mutation rate. So it follows, right, that if you actually take data from a, um, you know, a sample of sequences, right, say in humans, uh, if you look at the ancestry of that thing, right, there will, be, there will have been more recombination events in the history of that sample than there will have been mutations, right? Mutations you can see, the recombination events you can't see, but you can sometimes know that they have been there. Uh, there is a bunch of textbooks, I mean, if you search for detecting recombination, you find stuff from the bacterial literature where people are looking for, like, essentially gene conversion tracts because of sort of bacterial sex and, and things like this. This is not terribly relevant for, for the kind of uh, meiotic recombination we're talking about here, which is much more common. A very simple thing to do is the, is the so-called four gamete test. If you have two diallelic loci, you know, so with SNPs, right, zero and one, if you find all four gametes, right, so you have zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one, there must have been a recombination event under the assumption that mutations are unique. This can be an exercise. Go home, draw some trees, convince yourself that this is true. That if, there, if there's no recombination, right, uh, then there is a single tree. And then you cannot possibly get all four possible uh, allelic combinations, right? This can only happen if either there were repeat mutations, you know, from a phylogenetic point of view, this would be homoplasy, right? Otherwise, there's something, it's not a tree. Okay. Yeah, okay, so, right. And, of course, a lot of these you can't detect. And so, basically, one, one thing you will notice is that there is no chance of, in most organisms of reconstructing the recombination graph because, simply, most of these recombination events are going to be completely invisible, right? But it's very important to realize that it's there. And especially, I mean, there's a temptation. I constantly, I mean, even today, like, you know, years after, like, People should know this by now. There's a temptation for everyone to get some sequence data, to chug it into some phylogenetic tree building algorithm, and it, you know, it draws a tree. This is a known property of clustering algorithms, right? That they produce a cluster. Whether the cluster makes sense or not is not clear, right? You will always get a, a bloody tree out of a tree drawing algorithm, right? You know, then there are these networky things that try to do it, but you know, I don't never understood what it is they actually try to draw. I mean, what we actually have, we know that there is some kind of uh, graph underlying this. We know that we will never be able to reconstruct it. That's the true structure of this thing, right? Then you have mutations that give an imperfect representation of this, right? Uh, but it certainly isn't a tree. I mean, it just can't be if you think about how much recombination is going on here. Unless you're looking at some non-recombining region and so on, right? You might be able to draw a tree, but in that case, you should, like most for most sequence data, you should run something like this four gamete test and see that there should be no homeward places, right? So you can get a perfect tree. And like I said yesterday, the whole thing about perfect 
perfect genealogist and so on. It's like a subfield in computer science, and people love this stuff, right? Um, uh, yeah, okay. Um, yes, okay, so now, but what this means, right, is if you go along the genome, because there's recombination, it makes different chunks of the genome semi-independent of each other. So this evolutionary variance that I mentioned, you know, this variance, because you have random mutations on a, random, on a single random tree, which means that you can't consistently estimate theta, for instance, right? Now, that is no longer true if you, because if you have a large sequence data, because suddenly recombination breaks things into different trees, and they are all semi-independent, and suddenly, you know, the sort of law of large numbers starts applying in some sense. So, remember I showed you this thing, what the distribution is, if you just were to assume that the number of SNPs you see is Poisson distributed, coalescent, so that's compound process, right, but without recombination. If you add recombination, the process gets, uh, you know, so this is now with no recombination, it's spread out. You know, the more recombination you add, the more centralized it becomes in this region, because basically now you, you know, you're basically introducing independence, and in, you know, get several different coalescent processes as you, as you go along. Okay. What are we doing? Linkage to equilibrium, right? Um, so everyone knows what linkage to equilibrium. Here I'm going to have to, oh my god, going to have to skip a lot of stupid algebra here. Um, so linkage equilibrium, people measure the correlation in allelic states between SNPs, right? Uh, uh, this is the undergraduate genetics, right? So there's various different measures for this. You basically, you look for instance, as uh, Lewontin defined this measure D, which is basically the frequency of, uh, you have two loci with two alleles, right? The frequency of, so the loci uh, A and B with big A, little a allele, big B, little b allele, right? Uh, the frequency of seeing the A and B alleles together minus, you know, the product. If they were independent of each other, this would be zero, right? And there are various different measures of this. People often look now at the correlation, just the piercing correlation between SNPs as you go along. And these are all various continuous table statistics and, and so on and so forth. Uh, okay, so why is it called linkage to equilibrium? It's one of the most horrible terms in all of population genetics, of course, because you can have unlinked genes in, in linkage to equilibrium. So it really is only indirectly related to, to linkage, right? And so unlinked genes can be in LD, and linked genes are not necessarily in LD, right? Um, and furthermore, what does it have to do with equilibrium? So now I'm going to skip a bunch of boring algebra. Basically, okay, what I want to show you, so forget about this. What I'm going to show you is that if you, um, this is undergraduate textbook stuff, you can find this in, in one of the Charles Brooks books and so on. You can find this famous equation that if you look at how linkage equilibrium evolves over time from some starting frequency, you will all have seen something like this, I think, if you've done any population genetics books. If you start with the sum value of D at the beginning, then it decays with the recombination rate between the two loci over time, right? So the equilibrium will go to zero. But that's um, it's one of the most useless results in, in, in population genetics because in reality, the correlations you actually see reflects this ancestral recombination graph where you have an interplay between new mutations, genetic drift, and recombination. And you actually get things like this instead, right? So here, for example, these are some simulations. We're looking at, uh, you focus on a particular mutation here, which has, uh, what have I done here? I'm look, looking at the red bars. I'm looking at where there's shared ancestry between, uh, so there are like five of all these different haplotypes here that share a particular SNP. They will, that are sitting in this position, right? And you're looking at how much of the original haplotype in which that mutation arose, so they're still sharing. Uh, this is relatively early, so there's long haplotype sharing. And if you throw mutations on all, on all this stuff, you get a pattern like this. If you look at this is Pearson's correlation, you get SNPs that are correlated with that thing. And this is used in association mapping, right? You get sort of a correlation with the SNP in that position. If you have a more common allele that is older, the haplotypes will have broken up more and you get a much finer resolution. There's only one SNP that is correlated here very, very closely with this. Uh, since I'm almost out of time. And you, you may almost certainly see in plots like this. This is from the Human HapMap project. This is 100 KB of so chromosome 8. 
uh, and this is going along the chromosome here, right? For each position, you just look at the correlation with the SNP here and every other SNP sort of in, in this direction, right? The red, red triangles is like, here's a region where the SNP here is perfectly correlated. So basically you only find, if you have zero one for SNPs, right? You know, you find only one, one and, and zero, zero. You have, you know, they're completely correlated when they're completely red like this. You get large blocks of LD. But you can see a pattern, right? Where this, so here, and here is a clear evidence that there must have been recombination here, right? And when these patterns were first seen, people interpreted these as hotspot recombination. Some of them are, some of them are just by chance, right? Because there is undenying this one single ancestral recombination graph that connects all, all these data. But you get this blockiness here, but you can see that they're like large chunks of increased LD. Then between these blocks here, there's been a lot of independence. Uh, you can see that the pattern of linkage equilibrium between Chinese, Japanese, and Caucasians is correlated, and also with Yorubans from Nigeria, but there's much less LD here. And that's because Africans have a much higher effective population size have had historically, right? So there's been more time for recombination than, than there's less uh, linkage equilibrium. Ooh, that got a bit fast. Okay, so, ah, all right. So I'm going to have to talk about selection uh, tomorrow because I'm thinking I'm out of time here. But, all right, I'll stop here. So any questions? This got a bit faster at the end, I'm afraid. Uh, I should have had two weeks for this, I realize. Yeah, yeah, Questions, concerns, or coffee? I guess it's coffee time, huh? All right.